Soon after the Second World War, in the early 50s, when uh, many societies like India were newly becoming independent, free of the colonial shackles, there was a concern to develop, to catch up with the industrial age. At that time, there was a concern to rapidly develop and industrialize these countries. At that time, there were researchers, academicians, sociologists who wanted to examine how does change take place, how does a traditional society rapidly tra transform itself to a modern society. Everett Rogers is one such an academician from the United States of America, and it's our privilege to have him with us today. Dr. Rogers, to start our discussion, could you talk a little bit about your first early visits to India and what was exciting then and what were you uh, here for? Yes, it was in uh, 1963 uh, and I was invited to uh, India by um, the National Institute of Community Development, uh, then in Missouri, uh, later in Hyderabad. Uh, to uh, work as a consultant on a research project uh, conducted in UP State uh, in the district around Luk Ludia Lucknow in eight villages. Uh, and we were investigating uh, the role of radio and radio forums and adult literacy in uh, speeding the process of the diffusion of agricultural and health innovations. So that must be uh, 1963, today's 1987, it must be about 24 years ago. It seems that it was the yesterday. Well, you know, uh, India at that time, the Radio Rural Forum experience was a very important kind of innovative experience in the use of communication media. It, and subsequently, there has been the satellite instructional television experiment. What were some of the significant findings that you found in this process? Uh, in fact, in those days, India was uh, a pioneer in um, uh, forming new effective methods of bringing around rural development. And uh, especially the part that I was most interested in, the role of communication, especially mass communication in, in development. Uh, that study was an important one. The, the study, there had been an earlier study uh, in the area around uh, Punem. This had been uh, some eight or 10 years before our study, in which uh, radio f uh, forms were really tested on a pilot basis. Uh, in Maharashtra state. They were, that evaluation showed that they had important effects uh, in diffusing and bringing about uh, agricultural development, rural development. And so our study uh, was in a way a follow-up study uh, to see if radio forums could have the same effects when not on a pilot basis. Because by that time, 1963, uh, there were uh, radio farm forums throughout India. In fact, they were rather at their heyday in, in, in that era, and in fact, were being copied by many other nations. I think the main effect of our study was to reaffirm in India the importance of combining uh, the mass media, electronic media, radio in this case, uh, with local discussion groups, uh, radio forums, uh, to bring about rural development. And that basic idea, simple as it sounds to us today, uh, was the idea that spread to uh, 25 or 30 countries, uh, other countries in Asia, in Latin America, and especially in Africa. But as you know, uh, the Radio Rural Forum and the success of the Radio Rural Forum in the 50s and the early 60s really petered out. Yeah. And then we got a further impetus with the site experiment. But once again, we seem to be grappling with this problem of not being able to sustain things uh, and in that, would you uh, have uh, any observations as to how do these things peter out? Yes, uh, they do peter out. Uh, many of these um, new approaches to bringing about rural development, uh, if they last uh, a decade, sometimes they're, they're lucky, and sometimes two decades. Uh, but eventually, all of them uh, seem to peter out. Uh, I have two views of this. One is that uh, the sustained administrative management uh, infrastructure to, to continue with them uh, isn't available uh, in many countries. And for that reason, they peter out. And that, that is part of their demise. Uh, another part is that they are often replaced 
by yet more effective means. This is an optimistic view, of course, of the rise and fall of these techniques. And uh, sometimes, I think as in the case of the radio forms, that was more the case. Um, it was true in the sense that the radio forms, in a way, led to their own demise. Uh, they were effective uh, to a certain extent, our study showed and other experience in other countries showed, in uh, bringing about rural development as villagers uh, came to have wider perspectives, came to adopt uh, innovations, came to gradually, bit by bit, change their lifestyles. Uh, it made radio forms themselves become somewhat out of date. And in many countries, uh, the first country this happened in was Canada, uh, where as, ca as rural Canadian society um, developed, uh, there came to be less and less interest in, by, on the part of farmers in taking part in radio farm forums, farmers and their wives. And uh, by the early 60s, about the time that we were doing this first study, in which I was involved in India, the Lucknow study, uh, the last radio forum in, in Canada died. Uh, to be replaced by other forms, uh, tele clubs, many other techniques of communication. So they petered out in part because of their own effectiveness. Uh, well, certainly in our country, the Radio Rural Forum didn't give way to tele clubs no. or anything like that. No. And in fact, uh, it is often said, and perhaps uh, not wrongly, that the expectations from the media, particularly television, uh, is becoming much more entertainment oriented True. and uh, therefore its educative role is being missed out. There's no doubt that uh, in the 50s and 60s, uh, our, I, I include myself, uh, our ideas about the mass media were overly, overly simple. Uh, in those days we thought if we could get widespread exposure, a, a large audience in essence, for radio, later for television, uh, that that would sort of automatically bring about development. That assumed, of course, that the content, the relevant educational content, would be in the media. Uh, that has been, of course, a surprise. A surprise, that would have been a big surprise to me to have learned that in the 50s and 60s, because uh, governments were uh, heavily pledged to uh, uh, avoiding uh, entertainment content, at least as the main content, of the mass media, and especially of the electronic media. So in those days, I'm talking now about 1963, certainly our idea was that television, when it came, would be mainly an educational television uh, in the third world. Uh, and, and in fact, it is, that has not happened. Well, partly also it's because of political imperatives, I should think. I mean, let's take the case of uh, the peach transmitter near Ahmedabad, which okay. was for a long time, the, it has had a rural character, but mm -hmm. the moment the coverage from Ahmedabad city came, uh, the urban population insisted on a different kind of fare. I, I would say there's almost a, a law. It's a law that I don't like, but uh, I have to admit there is such a law, or a principle perhaps, and that is that entertainment content drives out educational content. Uh, it's more exciting, it's, it's more interesting to audiences, and so when audiences have a choice, and this is true in my own country, where educational television is watched by a very small percent, one percent of our national audience, while the other 99 percent are watching commercial entertainment television. Uh, that was a surprise also in the U.S. That was not what was expected, uh, but it did happen. So I think the, the principle, which I don't like, but which I recognize, is that entertainment sort of beats out uh, educational content. Now, maybe there's a possibility, I think there is, and I hope we'll return to this issue in our discussion today, of uh, making educational content entertaining, mixing the two together subtly uh, so that what looks like entertainment content also has some educational content. In fact, I was just going to ask you, in this context, uh, there's this talk of soap operas and using soap opera techniques to, uh, in infuse it with a social content. And uh, in India also some efforts have been made. Uh, uh, are you aware of it or? Uh? Yes, uh, I think uh, that my frustration at, uh, uh, of the 1960s era studies in which we didn't pay much attention to content, we assumed it would be educational. I think my frustration over the lack of development effects 
when then a medium became widespread in a country like radio in India, as television is today. I think it was that frustration that led me to be especially alert to these possibilities of combining uh, entertainment and education. Uh, I think it was in the uh, mid-70s that I first became aware of, a edu of an unintentionally educational soap opera uh, in Latin America. Uh, this was a soap opera called Simplemente Maria in Spanish just simple Mary. Uh, and in short, it was the uh, Cinderella story of a slum girl who came to work in a rich household, became a very uh, good seamstress, a good stitcher, used a Singer sewing machine on, in the program. Uh, of course, there was some uh, emotion in the program. She fell in love with the uh, rich family's son. They could not marry, of course, naturally. This is a soap opera, after all. Uh, and it uh, appealed to uh, vast audiences in Latin America. It set the highest rating records of, of its time. This was in the early 70s in Latin America. The surprise was that this commercial entertainment program uh, began to sell uh, very large numbers of Singer sewing machines. In whatever country this program was shown, the sale of Singer sewing machines went up to the roof. Not of any kind of sewing machine, but of Singer sewing machines. Uh, this led to uh, a very um, ingenious uh, television uh, director, producer in Mexico, who works for the uh, national television system of Mexico, Televisa. His name is Miguel Cebido. Starting in 1976, 77, he began to uh, produce soap operas that were intentionally educational and entertaining. Uh, in essence, he took the heart of the idea from Simplemente Maria where this happened by accident, and made it happen year after year for six years. Uh, and I'll end this uh, story, this odyssey, by saying that uh, then a few years ago, as we know, uh, the idea, very much adapted to Indian conditions, uh, led to uh, Humlog, uh, this educational soap opera that was intended to uh, promote the idea of family planning and uh, to promote uh, other desired social values like female equality, gender equality. Uh, and that idea has then spread from India to other countries, Kenya, Nigeria, and uh, some other third world countries today. The question that I would like to ask you is that while it, uh, in uh, introducing a social content to a basically entertaining film mm -hmm. uh, might attract audiences, mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of change in attitudes or behavioral changes or practices, mm -hmm. uh, is there any significance? We don't know. Uh, we're trying to find out. Uh, I'm here in India on this trip mainly with a colleague, uh, a doctoral student in the Annenberg School of Communication at the University of Southern California, where I teach in Los Angeles. Uh, his name is Arvind Singhal. Uh, this will be his Ph.D. dissertation, and uh, it is uh, a study, I think, of much significance. In essence, we are trying to answer that question in the case of Humlog. Did Humlog indeed encourage the uh, adoption and use of contraceptives? Uh, did it indeed change attitudes and behavior regarding gender equality? Did it lead to other desired, intended educational objectives, as well as attracting large audiences and helping sell the commercial products that were advertised on it? We don't have uh, a, a, a careful evaluation of the Mexican soap operas, the six. There is evidence that they were very strong in their effects. I'll take one example. Uh, the first soap opera in Mexico was called in Spanish, Ven conmigo, come with me. Uh, and it concerned an adult literacy class. Uh, it was a soap opera with emotion and passion and theatrical content. But it also subtly promoted very much the idea of participating in adult literacy classes. The implied message was you can, despite many day-to-day -day difficulties, participate and become literate. Uh, and uh, the aggregate data about the effects of this program in Mexico, this was broadcast again in the late mid-70s, uh, was that it led about another million people uh, to enroll in adult literacy classes. There had been an enrollment of about four million, and it took it up to about five million. Now, as a social scientist, I have to point out that um, that's, of course, a very big increase. But one question that I'm sorry uh, to interrupt, 
but uh, how much weightage can one give to the impact of media? I mean, surely there are other contributing factors, uh, socioeconomic conditions, which milieu adapts to it, and was it adapted by the milieu where that kind of an adoption is necessary? That, that's why uh, an independent um, scientific evaluation is needed right. uh, to seek to measure and control on or remove these other causes of increased literacy attendance. That same year, uh, there was a national literacy campaign in Mexico with other media. W well, it was part of a campaign. So it happened that this program was being broadcast at the same time right. that these other influences were happening. The answer to the question of, of which, of how much effect did yeah. the soap opera have, then rests on gathering data from each of a sample of participants uh, and uh, determining from them whether they also were exposed to these other influences. Uh, that is also, in a broad sense, what we're seeking to do in the case of Humlog here, mm -hmm. here in India. I guess it's, uh, uh, it's a contribution that a social scientist, that social scientific research can make to important policy questions like, can educational soap operas have an educational effect? Or how much educational effect do they have? I would now like to turn to some of your more recent right. work on the whole impact of uh, technology and mm -hmm. communication technology. And now, as you know, uh, if we began in the industrial age and the importance of mass media mm -hmm. to help uh, rural, uh, principally rural societies to catch up with mm -hmm. the industrialized countries, today we are talking of an information age where uh, the more advanced countries are uh, already there. and. It's a question of leapfrogging into the information age. Uh, would you like to share some thoughts with you? Yes, that's a, a, a very main uh, intellectual interest of mine uh, today. Uh, let's start with my own country, the US, which uh, we say is an information society today, uh, in the sense that the, our, the largest, the majority of our workforce, about 55% of our workers, uh, today work in jobs in which they mainly handle information. So this would include uh, a computer programmer. It would include a teacher. My main job is to teach students to convey information. Uh, it would include a factory manager in that he mostly doesn't work with nuts and bolts or with producing food. It's mostly working with information. So if you add up all of these jobs, there are about 55 percent, more than half of our workforce. It took us uh, many years to get there. And we, the US, got there by going through the Industrial Revolution, in which the majority of our workers became industrial workers. And then we went through another transition and became an information society. Now the question for most of the world is, can a nation leapfrog uh, into becoming an information society without having to have gone through 100 years of being an industrial society? Uh, that's a tough question. Uh, it certainly c won't happen, can't happen, in the same way that it happened in America, in England, um, in France, in Germany, and so on. Uh, time doesn't allow it. Uh, processes are different. Um, and, and so a very important, I would say, the intellectual question of our, of our day is, uh, can nations like India become information societies, if they wish to, uh, in ways that don't take 100 years and in which you don't have to have uh, Manchester's and Birmingham's and Chicago's and Oakland's and Pittsburgh's uh, for a hundred years to get there. How will that happen? How might it happen? Uh, the idea is that it might happen through new communication technologies. So they become, the computer especially, becomes the driving force of the information society in a similar way that the steel mill or that the applications of steam power, the steam en engine did, in the case of the industrial society. But uh, uh, talking of the rate or the pace of change, uh, you know, transforming a society from an agricultural society to an, uh, el, uh, to an industrial That's society and to uh, an information society mm -hmm. where things have to move at the speed of electronic circuitry, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what are the strains that poses on a society. Are there any studies that you may have done uh, or a, any, uh, and, and the resistance, the, you know, after all, the human being asserts uh, itself also? Yes. Uh, in 1984, I finished a study of um, Silicon Valley, this center for uh, microelectronics, computers, and semiconductor chips that's located in Northern California. 
between the cities of San Francisco and San Jose. Uh, this is an area of about uh, 250,000 workers, so it is not a vast uh, area. Uh, physically, it's an area about 10 miles by 20 miles, so it's neither physically large nor large in numbers of workers. Uh, but it is the main center for the production of these new technologies uh, for my country. And so my logic was, why not go to uh, Silicon Valley to get a glimpse of the information society of the future today? Well, uh, the picture that emerges of Silicon Valley is not entirely a happy picture. Uh, on one side, it is extremely happy, uh, vast wealth. Uh, Silicon Valley, among these 250,000 employees, has uh, two billionaires. We have 14 billionaires in America. Two of them uh, are business partners in Silicon Valley, Hewlett and Packard. Uh, we have about 15,000 millionaires, many of them aged 40 or, or less. Uh, and so uh, on the money side, uh, vast wealth. Silicon Valley perhaps is one of the greatest concentrations of wealth in the world today. Certainly it is the greatest concentration of self-made wealth uh, in short-term business entrepreneurial activities. On the downside, the negative side, Silicon Valley has the highest divorce rate in the state, California, that has the highest divorce rate, in the nation that has the highest divorce rate. Uh, it has uh, extreme problems of pollution, traffic congestion, uh, unplanned uh, urban, semi-urban, uh, suburban growth. Uh, it has uh, many signs of stress uh, on the part of the people who, who work in Silicon Valley. It is a very high-speed lifestyle with very long hours of work. Uh, a recent survey, no, I did not do this survey, but it was done by uh, competently, of a sample of Silicon Valley workers found that the average uh, Silicon Valley employee in this, these high technology firms uh, was averaging uh, about 72 hours uh, a week, or almost twice a 40 hour week. Uh, and there are many, many signs of the personal cost uh, that those long hours of work uh, take. Now, people are not working those hours because they're forced to do so by a supervisor. Uh, they are so in love with their jobs. Right. They want to, but there is a human cost. So an information society need not necessarily be a happier one. <laughs> it need not be a happier one. Uh, it's, a, it's a rich one, but it may not be a happy one. And one final question, Dr. Rogers. Apart from your professional work, what is it that attracts you to India? Uh, I think I may have been an Indian in a previous life. Uh, I've, I've had people tell me that uh, perhaps I was once an Indian. I've always felt at home in India. and. Um, uh, I think I'm one of these many Americans who just uh, loves your country and uh, I keep coming back and I've been coming back for uh, now all these uh, 24 years. I'll probably be coming back for the next 24. I hope so. We hope so too. Thank you. who has a Wimbledon title under her belt is uh, Liz Smiley there on the left of the picture. 1985, she won this title, the ladies' doubles, with Cathy Jordan. Springing a real surprise, they climbed back from 